Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. And actually, after this very nice presentation for Alison, I mean, I'm really amazed of what is happening about this idea of really allowing people uh, free access to education. I think this is um, a wonderful case, actually. And um, I'm here, yeah, to ha I actually have this difficult role after your presentation to show what is the reality in Europe, at least, and what is happening with regards to vocational education and training. So for those of you who don't know me, um, I'm Anastasia. I work as an expert in qualifications and credentials at CEDEFOP. CEDEFOP is the European Agency for Vocational Training in Greece. We are situated in Thessaloniki. Uh, that was not always the case. We used to be in Berlin, uh, in Germany. Uh, but after 1995, the decision was to, to move to that beautiful country of ours. Um, yeah, I'm actually leading this research on micro-credentials for VET, for vocational education and training. And I think um, when we started back in 2019, actually when we were designing a call for tender for this important research work, we saw that actually empirical da data was not there at all. Um, there was a lot of literature, let's say read, written about higher education, uh, lots of discussions happening at uh, policy level, but actually we, are, we were, and I think we are still a bit missing the empirical data, let's say the concrete evidence on what is happening in countries about this topic. So I think this is my value or actually um, what I would like to show to you today. So um, when we started this research work, we wanted really to cover three main areas. First of all, we wanted to understand how micro-credentials are perceived in countries in Europe, but always focusing on VET, on vocational training and labor market-related education training. And I can tell you this was not an easy exercise at all. Even when, in the cases when we tried, for example, to conduct a very important stakeholder group survey, uh, where we tried to identify specific target groups like uh, VET providers, uh, ministries, like the people that are let's say, uh, behind the public sector, but also employers and employees, we realized that the term as such was very confusing. It was not really understood well. So, I mean, I'm amazed that today we, we are gathered uh, really to discuss the topic of micro-credentials where two years or so, I mean, countries were really struggling to understand what micro-credentials is. Um, the second topic we try to understand better and really uh, get more insights is this important link between micro-credentials and qualifications, qualification systems and frameworks in Europe. And thirdly, uh, the last, um, let's say, research, research work we are undertaking is related to the added value for the end user. Because micro-credentials is a kind of a currency. They really need to signal their value to all types of end users out there. And I will tell you more about that. So in the first, let's say, theme, when we tried really to embark on this journey and to understand what micro-credentials are, well, the findings that we collected were the following. Of course, we, we saw that quite often there are different features and characteristics that are common in these types of micro-credentials in vocational education training. These are related to the title, to the date of the issuing, the identity, the provider. So you have different elements being, let's say, integrated in the, the actual terminology. Quite surprisingly, we thought it would be only online learning, but that's not the case, at least in the countries we were exploring. We saw lots of uh, instances of traditional face-to-face -face mode, let's say, of delivery, and I think this is uh, really important in the way we, we are discussing digital credentials, digitalization, but still, everyday learning education really takes place in classrooms, and this is a fact, at least for the year 2023. Of course, this changes, but it is actually um, a current situation. Of course, there are different types of learners that are engaged in micro-credentials. From our results of the study, we saw that uh, they are mostly popular for employees, for new hires, for adults, actually the ones that are sometimes really um, uh, dropping out of education. They, they have this opportunity to get back into uh, real, you know, uh, real education uh, pathways and they want to, to somehow upskill uh, their profile. So in that sense, they are really appealing. Of course, um, we also saw that there, is this, there has been a very important debate at the European level. Um, and, this was and this was very much linked to this idea of micro-credentials actually threatening what is already existing. Let's say the existing offer, what qualifications, traditional qualifications have to offer. But we realized from that study that uh, all this emerging phenomenon of micro-credentials is not there to really threaten what is already existing, but rather add or complement to the existing offer. So against those critical voices, especially from trade unions in Europe, we really had to 
uh, justify very well and uh, provide the good arguments uh, in order to support the statement. Of course, as I said, our important focus is related to qualifications and to evolving qualification systems in Europe. But before giving you the findings on that specific theme, I wanted actually to show you what I consider a very important tension. Tension between the public and the private system, right? So we, we saw already what Alison uh, is doing, what is happening with LinkedIn, amazing, let's say, activity, thousands of learners and students uh, in private sector, really this cost issue, um, all these different barriers that we would consider in the public sector are really overcome. So on the one hand, you have like the supply and the demand side. And I think this is a very important, let's say, equilibrium. This is a, a very important tension. But at the, same that, at the same time, it actually shows a kind of a flow uh, from one side to another. And we need to consider that, that, that these are two poles that might be contradicted, but at the same time, very attracting uh, each other. And then on the other hand, you have this idea of a qualification that for me is very, very important. And then although we are used to uh, acquiring, obtaining these traditional qualifications that are addressing specific target groups with specific times of learning, ways of learning and everything, on the other hand, you have these more flexible and nimble qualifications and credentials appearing that are very uh, interesting for a diverse group of learners. So again, another tension and, and all these discussions need to be considered when we are actually overgeneralizing or creating different statements on micro-credentials. Right, so I think this is um, an important element we, we need to take into account. Of course, when talking about qualification, somebody being qualified, even if it's higher education, vocational education, training, general education, in all types of learning, we need to understand that it cannot be a single or unique concept. That is why we adopted this dual perspective where we consider that qualified can be somebody in the sense, of course, of having a formal qualification as well, no. But as we've seen in reality from the private sector, it's actually, it's actually all this idea of demonstrating, really showing your ability, your actual skills and competences that your the employer would really uh, like to seek for. So in that sense, again, there's another tension of what we consider more traditional or more modern type of qualification and credential. So in that sense, we can see then the important link between those two different worlds. Actually, if you think about the important function be behind those more modern type of qualification credentials, you see all this idea of lifelong learning, these alternative pathways uh, to education, all this facilitating all types of learning you might have acquired, not only from the formal system, but of course from the non-formal system. And this is why validation in that sense is very important. <clears throat> now, our findings, <clears throat> sorry. So our findings showed <clears throat> that micro-credentials do not necessarily present a new form uh, of learning, of recognition. But they are rather there to better define what already exists. And one, when we try to really engage in this important exercise in countries in Europe, <clears throat> we saw that the different qualification systems vary a lot across countries. So for example, what is the situation, the German qualification framework, for example, would be quite distinct from the Greek uh, qualification system or the Italian one. So for, for sure there's this diversity into the national system and this needs to be considered when we are discussing the topic of micro-credentials. Of course, there are two main elements that have... Uh, But there are two main elements that have paved the way for the inclusion of micro-credentials in national qualification frameworks. Because for us, this is a very important part of the story. Because we saw that credentials and micro-credentials can be trusted quite often when they are linked to the national system, to the national qualification frameworks. And we saw that when countries have been opening up their system to these different types of qualification credentials, this can actually act as a very important enabling factor. And at the same time, this modularization of qualification is very important. Um, quite often, uh, our countries, though, the people who are participated in our interview and the stakeholder group survey program, they were telling us that modules and partial qualifications are micro-credentials in their case. And then again, you would have these very important critical voices alarming us that, no, 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 you cannot possibly do that. That our qualifications are the ones that we know. You cannot have this new policy hype, this, this new buzzword, let's say, interfering with the classical uh, traditional educational system. So that is why we really needed to understand and go deeper into the country level and see how this topic is actually perceived. <clears throat> 
Um, also, the micro-credentials we have identified are mainly uh, traced in the EQF levels. If you know the EQF is the European Qualification Framework uh, Translation Grid. It's actually a grid of different levels in, in Europe. So, uh, related to that, we saw that the examples we have collected are mainly placed from level 2 to 5, usually in that uh, part of, uh, of the system of education. Of course, quality assurance principle is very important for these uh, phenomena, especially when we are considering national processes or how the public sector is actually opening, opening up to these type of credentials. There are all the countries in Europe are engaging currently in different discussions, uh, policy discussions. And what we saw is that we could place them under these three categories, as you can see in the slide. And this depending, is depending on the stage of development of those discussions. So you have actually the biggest, let's say, proportion of European countries are already in the first case. So they are currently discussing, eh? they are at the very initial stage. And you see like in cases like in Australia, New Zealand, or the USA, how the topic has already been very well received, how micro-credentials are being issued. And here in Europe, at least at the policy discussion, this is the reality, right? And then you have this more advanced policy discussion, like in the case of Netherlands, Poland, or Slovakia. They're, in Slovakia, it's a very interesting country case example. They're preparing a law, and they would like actually to introduce not the term micro-credentials per se, but rather the term micro-qualification or micro-certificate. Again, depending whether the, this specific micro-credential is inside the public sector or outside the formal system somehow. And then, of course, you have some other specific cases in countries where they are actually developing draft regulation or legal documents. And this is very important at the moment. But always reflecting about VET, vocational training, and labor market, then what we tried to do is we wanted to zoom in on the specific type of certificates that are being issued. And we wanted to see what is actually the link between micro-credentials. And if we think about sectoral and professional skill certificates, I mean, the question was, can we really consider those type of certificates and micro-credentials? Well, depending on the national context, we have varied, varied replies from the countries we were working on. And then the other thing, so one thing is the variety, the diversity. And then another level of complex complexity is the fact that these types of sectoral and professional skills certificates can either be awarded upon a com com completion of an organized learning activity, right? Or even following just you know, uh, a performance-based assessment. So this is important. So in that sense, we think that they're very, very relevant to micro-credentials. But not all of these types of certificates, or if they are considered micro-credentials in the national context, uh, really enjoy the same level of trust and recognition as opposed to what is already existing in the labor market. So I think these elements of trust, uh, credibility, let's say added value, as we will see, are very important for a study. Now, of course, there are emerging questions. And the questions can be, for instance, what about those certificates that are only awarded following, like, let's say, the demonstration of your real life skills, huh? the skills you have acquired, your competencies? Can they be considered micro credentials? So, is actually micro credential only the certification, or is it something more than that? And then, should they kind of be more standardized, regulated? Because as I'm telling you, we are discussing a lot with national authorities, with ministries of education, ministry of labor in the different countries we are working on. And the reality is very much different from the private sector. In the case that we are now trying to create a kind of a register in Europe or a kind of a repository of different types of micro-credentials, we are actually engaging into a more formalized process. And then again, we are trying to hamper or, let's say, challenge this flexible nature of these types of certificates. So this is something to consider. So in essence, do we need to rebrand what is already functioning well in the system? This is a very concrete example of an exercise we have done on manufacturing and retail, where actually we extracted 40 examples of micro-credentials in those two sectors, because going into the sector really can give us more concrete data on what is happening in the topic. So what we saw is, for example, in Austria, in the area of manufacturing, the specific type of certification for CNC specialization, this kind of certificate, that actually shows this more highly target type of training that is designed around the specific occupation. At the same time, we also saw new and more emerging topics uh, being there in this specific sector. And if you go then to the workload that is associated with those type of certificates, we see there are so many differences. Differences in countries within the sector of manufacturing and the same, of course, for retail. So again, the workload is quite important as a, a factor to consider 
Of course, the mode of delivery might differ. It can be online, it can be a blended type of learning. So you see already the diversity in one sector in specific countries. Imagine to cover all sectors in Europe and of course beyond and to understand better what is happening. So in these, in these specific examples, especially, I mean, the, this idea of learning outcomes is a key uh, one, at least in Europe, because we think it's all this aspect of really showing at the end of a learning process all your knowledge, skills, and competencies. And is that really grasping these kind of micro-credentials in this sector? Well, not necessarily, uh, not, and not always. That is not always the case, because they might, for instance, in these examples, we can see the description of learning outcomes, but there are many of those that do not have any reference to that. So that even creates the comparability exercise uh, more difficult. Of course, modularization is a very important element. And uh, here you see some examples. I will not read them, of course. But you can see how different countries in Europe try to link what they have in terms of their modularized offer to micro-credential. What is interesting in, the, in Spain, for instance, that you're producing uh, this new system of formal vocational training that actually spans from micro training uh, to degrees and more specialization courses. So I think this is very important because, it, in essence, it is based on how the learner progresses from one course to another, and this is um, an important element. Of course, different terms are as used, as I said, again, Croatia, another example here, the term micro-qualification is used instead of uh, micro-credential. Here, you can see highlighted, again, different are the concepts that countries are using. Um, it's interesting, like, for example, in Malta, they have these types of awards that are very important. They are considered a type of a credential. And, of course, they are very much linked to their existing national qualification framework and, of course, then linked to the European one. And this is, for us, important, let's say, empirical data that we need to consider. Um, in Poland, they even have market qualifications that are flourishing also outside the non-formal system, and they are also considered micro-credentials. So you see there's a lot of activity taking place in Europe, and we have the data, at least from the countries we covered, to, to show to everyone. Um, links with recognition of prior learning, this is a very important element in the story. Uh, because we again saw this double function of micro-credentials, it can be either the outcome, the result of a process of, of, a process of recognized non-formal learning, but at the same time they can have this important function of uh, enabling, uh, a kind of a door opener to, towards, let's say, obtaining a partial qualification or going towards a full degree, uh, <clears throat> gaining access to an education program, or even gaining exemption from what is already existing. And again, I'm putting specific examples in countries that we have um, examined, and I think this is important. <clears throat> there are challenges and opportunities, of course, and I think we, maybe you've already discussed it like yesterday, I didn't have the opportunity to be with you, but I think this oversupply, uh, really, of micro-credentials, that somehow they are spread around public, uh, private system in different countries around the globe, that can actually cause a kind of a devaluation, and this is something that we need to consider. Of course, um, I think that um, there were also another critical voice. This came actually from employer organizations in countries in Europe that were telling us that um, we are risk, uh, let's say, um, creating a more fragmented picture of education because it actually shows this tendency for a young person to really, instead of pursuing a, a full degree program, to go into this shorter learning experience. And what does that mean, in essence, for education overall? This whole, whole having this whole holistic concept of education behind. So I think this is important. And just shortly, the last part of my presentation, the added value for end users, because as I said, this is an important aspect that we had to consider. Of course, it's again this tension and dimension of the supply and the demand side. And we realize that the way national VET systems are governed is very important. And this really has an effect on how these credentials are actually perceived by end users in the different countries. What is, you know, the, the role of training labor market policies? Again, this is a, an important factor that we need to consider how, for example, uh, they will save this ecosystem of micro-credentials that is actually being formed. And, of course, all these uh, dynamics that, that are out there in the skills uh, and the labor market. So it's quite often I think that we are discussing all this topic in education, let's say, closed in a room, only policymakers, um, uh, people representing education, sometimes Ministry of Labor, are actually actually very much um, actively engaging with us. But then if we are going out there and asking our learners, our students, 
Do they know about it? Do they care about it? Are they really interested in these types of learning? Nowadays, this again, we would have different results. So we always need to be very careful in the way we treat the data we are collecting and who is responding for us. Here, this is a kind of a very dense and uh, big uh, conceptual framework we have developed. But um, <clears throat> my idea is actually to show why trust as the first column is the first and foremost element we need to take into account when we are discussing micro-credentials. And there are different conditions for trust, <clears throat> but only if a credential is trusted, then we can really understand what is the added value and quite for the future, I would say, we would be in the position to examine the impact behind. And I think it already shows you that we try to define trust and added value according to who you are, who is our end user. It can be the learner, the education provider, or even the employer and the employee. So again, depending on your point of departure, you would have different insights in this bubble. Of course, in order for trust, let's say, to be there and to be actually in place, we need to see that credibility or the reputation of the provider is very important at, uh, uh, at this moment. And we definitely need to consider an assessment, an assessment practices, how you would really assess the knowledge, skills, and competencies that are acquired for the micro credential. So these are different conditions that are needed. Uh, we asked uh, the opinion of learners, uh, our end users, the employers and vet providers to tell us what they think about micro-credentials. There are different elements there. Depending on who you are, for example, if you are a learner, it's a, it's a kind of a, a, to, a, an opportunity to have a, a gainful employment, a better career prospect. But then if you go to the vet provider, it's a kind of an um, incentive uh, to really produce this new type of learning. So again, this I think what I really like is this graph. Um, <clears throat> We, we had asked uh, in, our, in a conference that we have made in November 2021, a graph designer to really capture the discussion we had. Uh, that was in an online event that we did at CEDEF, but of course we had uh, speakers from around the globe and Canada and Australia and New Zealand. So the actual finding that came from that nice graph there was that um, micro-credential, uh, I mean, they are something small. That is why you need like a kind of a microscope. You need to zoom in uh, in order to understand better what exactly it entails, what is the content behind this type of credential. And I think this is very much relevant, not only for the public sector, but also for the private sector. Um, of course, there are emerging questions like, for instance, could micro-credentials become a selection mechanism even that would even increase further the inequalities, the social inequalities we see in Europe at least. And will the provision of credentials, because we need to see who is providing these credentials, is it a vet institution, a higher education institution, is it a company, it, does it come from industry, but still, does it remain fragmented and disconnected? And of course, we need to really understand whether there are user-centered services. How do you approach the learner? What kind of guidance do you get? Where can they find information? What are the platforms to use? I think this is important. And my vision for the future, well, actually, it's not mine. I cannot say my vision because I'm representing CEDEFO, but I can say that it really depends on the countries themselves, on the national context, how, for example, they would like to go ahead with the newly recently uh, published recommendation from European Commission on the topic, but at the same time, they need to consider carefully their priorities. And of course, there can be different scenarios for the future. For example, as I said, we could even have a European registry or even opening up all types of national qualification frameworks to accept this type of credentials. But again, we always need to have in mind this more user and system perspective in order to understand whether these scenarios will flourish. And last but not least, we are also making an online event, 22nd and 23rd of June. In case you are interested, please uh, just write me an email and I will, all, uh, I will invite you to this meeting to discuss about this important topic. And this is my email. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anastasia. <laughs>